Hit it! Hey everybody, this is the Computer Geek 01010101 here, and today we're going to be taking a detailed look at my old Tech Room Firewall system in Advantech Uno 3072LA. Uh, pretty interesting machine, actually. So, uh, first let me give you the backstory on it. So, in uh, very late 2017, around uh, November of 2017, November or December of 2017, I believe, uh, one of our neighbors gave this particular computer to me along with an APC Smart UPS 1000 and uh, some other miscellaneous stuff. And ju it just so happened to be at the time I was preparing to bring up a uh, LAN, a local area network here in the tech room. So this machine, because it has dual Intel Gigabit Ethernet ports, uh, ended up getting ended up being awarded the position of Tech Room Firewall System. Now this machine started out on Ubuntu Server 16.04 LTS until I'd say uh, Christmas break 20. Christmas break 2018 and 2019, when I in did an in-place upgrade install uh, of Ubuntu Server 1804 on this system. I upgraded it to Ubuntu Server 1804. Either that or I did Either that or... Yeah, I, uh, I actually upgraded it to Ubuntu Server 1804. Uh, during Christmas break 2019-2020, I believe. I don't exactly recall when that happened. But anyways, it ran Ubuntu Server 1804 right up until the point it was decommissioned at the beginning of this year, January 20, 2021, is when this system was shut down. And I believe it was February 2021, February of this year, Whenever I uh, completely pulled the system out, whenever I completely pulled the system out of service and mothballed it, and it has since sat on a shelf in here for several months. Uh, this system was equipped with a 120 gigabyte hard drive and let's see, uh, two gigabytes of. DDR2, yes, two gigabytes of Transcend branded DDR2 RAM. So, uh, when I mothballed this system, when I mothballed this system indefinitely, uh, I pulled the CMOS battery, pulled the RAM, pulled the hard drive, wiped the hard drive. So this system is at this present moment non-functioning because it does not have uh, core essential components. So uh, as part of this detailed overview, we are going to perform a full teardown of this system. And uh, it's, it's a rather interesting piece of hardware. And as we put it back together, I am going to uh, go ahead and replace everything, put everything back into it, and in fact, I uh, just, in fact, Clonezilla just finished restoring the uh, disk, Im the last disk image I ever took of this system, uh, back to the hard drive that it once had. So, continue and power off. So. Okay, it's just been powered down. So, uh, here's the hard drive, hot off the hot off the press. I'm gonna go bumping into the table with the chair. So our teardown begins, and I might actually have to, and I'm actually going to go ahead and drop the height of the camera.
so that way you can see this better. Our teardown begins by removing these rails, these mounting rails, from the system. Now these mounting rails, uh, basically these mounting rails are what held the machine to the underside of the tech room desk. And if you see some dust on this side, that's because this is the side, this is the side that has uh, the motherboard and uh, processor on it. While the other side is just dead air. So I had a, so I had a couple of fans glue, glued to this side, like literally hot glued to the side of this system. Uh, to keep it uh, running reasonably cool. And if we look over here on this side, we have our two gigabit Ethernet ports, a DVI-I port, uh, which does support DVI-A, which does support DVI-A or DVI analog, so we can use a passive DVI to VGA adapter. We have four USB 2.0 ports, and we have two serial ports here, which in the system BIOS are configurable between RS-232 and RS-485 signaling protocols. And down, and down here at the bottom, we have a three-pin Phoenix connector. And down here at the bottom, we have a three-pin Phoenix connector, a headphone jack, a uh, power button and an eSATA port. And yeah, I know that was kind of random. Just back that off. And then in this PCI slot here, we have a uh, DAC card slash 2005. Uh, and I've looked, and those data acquisition cards are stupid expensive. So. Once we remove our uh, mounting rails, we'll go ahead and continue our teardown by removing the four screws holding the side panel on. Uh, the side holding the side panel on, you know, the side panel that doesn't have the motherboard uh, tray or anything like that. And we have tall screws at the top and short stubby screws here at the bottom because here at the bottom of this system lies a power supply module which also serves as an interposer module uh, between the motherboard and the hard disk. Let's go ahead and pop that off. And we see a uh, sill pad between heat sink on the power supply module and this uh, machined aluminum case. This just goes off to the side about the first time in a year. Your uh, first time in about five months. This uh, syst that the inside of the system is seeing the light of day. Prior to this, it had been well over a year since the inside of this particular system had even seen the light of day. I'll go ahead and get a screwdriver out and our teardown continues by removing this top panel. And just make sure there's not anything integrally dependent on that. And everything here is a CNC machined which is of course exactly what I would expect from an industrial computer such as this. Uh, now the reason why this system was retired from service is because uh, about the turn of the year I decided to go ahead and completely uh, rebuild my firewall solution from the ground up. So, I, uh, I did not settle, I did not initially settle on OpenSense as a firewall solution. In fact, uh, I used, 
I initially tried the firewall solution IP Fire, and the top has just come off. I had initially tried the firewall solution IP Fire, uh, because it was one of the only firewall pr uh, products that I could find uh, that were that would still boot on that was A still supported and B would still boot on 32-bit architectures of which this system is restricted to by uh, means of it only having an Intel Atom N270 processor and we'll go ahead and we will remove our uh, DAC card uh, 2005 at car 2005. We'll see when we get this thing out of here. Now, really, now someone at Advantech really had their uh, thinking cap on straight because if we undock the camera and look inside, you can see that there are two very nicely machined, very nicely milled cutouts here that allow a screwdriver perfect access that allows a screwdriver perfect access to the screws that hold the expansion card or cards in place so oh so yeah but i had initial i had initially tried ip fire however I ran into a uh, pretty big problem with it pretty quickly. Uh, IP Fire had absolutely no idea what to do. Yep, it's a DAC board 2005. IP Fire had absolutely no idea whatsoever what to do whenever uh, you had a proxy active and you were trying to do firewall rules at the same time. It just completely, div it effectively divided by zero, and uh, I got, I got nowhere really quickly. So, I had to make the decision to retire this system from service permanently, and in its place, uh, and in the system's place went an even older Athlon 64 computer, a former gaming computer built in November of 2004, uh, in its place, and that system, by virtue of it having an Athlon 64 processor, is able to run 64-bit software, including modern contemporary versions of OpenSense. So, you see, our teardown continues by means of removing a structural support brace. Uh, which is supposed to mechanically interconnect the two, uh, the front and back sides of the case. So go ahead and take that out. And go ahead and take this out. And then this lifts right on out. And we can go ahead and set things aside. So, now, this system uh, has a bit of a weird design quirk, uh, separating the uh, bottom, separating the uh, power supply, hard disk, hard disk, and basically I'm going to call this a riser card from the motherboard. Separating the motherboard riser card from the motherboard is a bit of an adventure due to the way it was designed. Uh, who knows, maybe I'll get it right. Who knows, maybe I'll end up getting it right right here on camera. But chances are I'm going to end up struggling with this for a half hour. So, take out the long screws here at the top. And do that. Go ahead and undo this. But uh, the motherboard riser card connects to the motherboard itself via a slot that looks 
not unlike a PCI Express uh, slot of some variant. However, the two are not electrically, the two might be mechanically compatible, but I can just about assure you the two are not electrically compatible in any sense of the imagination. So, let's see, yeah, those are separated. Okay, uh, let me see. Go ahead and separate this half. Something just dropped out. Okay, no screw. And. Yeah, it's definitely an adventure separating these two case halves. I do know one other thing we can do. We can take the we can take the side. We can take the, uh, the side. Oh, uh, we can take the bottom off of here. And this is a hard drive carrier. This right here is a hard drive carrier because it uh, carries a hard drive in a, uh, in a uh, shock isolation style mounting cage. Probably to protect the hard drive from whatever um, mechanical nasties that it might otherwise be subjected to in, industri in an industrial environment. Because I mean, these systems are basically designed to be shoved in a cabinet under a conveyor belt in a harsh environment. Like, for all we know, one of these systems could end up, ru could end up running a conveyor belt. And could be running a conveyor belt. There we go. So, tiny, short SATA cable comes out. And here's our hard drive carrier. But, I mean, for all we know, one of these systems could be shoved in a hundred and shoved in a 120 degree cabinet right now running a running a conveyor belt on an industrial uh mining excavator out in the middle of nowhere out in the middle of nowhere texas so yeah so let's see if i can uh, struggle with this for a half hour you see, one thing I could do is I could unscrew this board and just pull it away from the rest of the system. However, that would entail removing this right here. I don't know. I'll give it a shot. I think that's what I'm going to actually have to do to get this thing out of here. I don't know, I've never taken uh, this thing out before. Okay, that's neat. That lifts out and I think I have just found out how to properly disassemble this. Okay, let's go ahead and find the appropriate size bit. Okay, so I think I just found out how one is supposed to properly separate these two halves. It looks like you have to take the uh, slot Looks like you have to remove all your expansion cards and uh, any slot brackets if they're installed, if uh, any remain in the system. And then you have to take out the uh, slot bracket holder, which basically remove all expansion cards and expansion slot blanks. Then take out a single, uh, basically a locking screw, and it literally just lifts out of the system. And then you can unscrew your power, your uh, motherboard riser card. So it seems. And 
Then, is that a serious logic? No, Oxford Semiconductor. And then, you can unscrew your riser card. And then, they separate and one very neatly lifts out of the system. So here it is in all its glory. As I said, that looks a lot like a PCI Express slot. However, I, however, it looks like it's actually a little bit longer and it could be keyed slightly differently. Uh, but if it does wind up being a, a mechanically compatible, I don't imagine you would ever want to plug this I don't imagine you would probably want to plug this into a system with a PCI Express uh, slot on it, not to mention the physical dimensions of the board are completely incompatible with such a concept. Okay. So, right here is the uh, connector for the breakout cable uh, for the SATA power. Just plugs in right there. Very neat. Let me separate that. And then under here are some really big uh, buck converters that serve to that. Uh, like, I'm just looking at them, they almost look like big old linear regulators. And those get, and you know how linear regulators like to get hot, which I can assure you they do. And they looks like if they heat sink, this transfers to the case, and the fans blow the heat away from from there. And here is a PCI a conventional PCI slot cover, which is a very nice. So we'll go ahead and put that on there, and we'll set that aside. And then it looks like the motherboard uh, module. And it looks like the uh, motherboard half of the case uh, almost pulls free. Uh, got some screws on the DVI-I connector. They appear to, appear to need to be removed. So I'll grab some needle nose and duckbill pliers. Oh, and there's the ones on the serial port too, so go ahead and start out with go ahead and start out with duckbill pliers to break things free. And ain't even close to being ready yet. Okay, that's all freed up. Learn something new every day. And today, I just happened to learn how to properly disassemble this system after having owned it for almost four years. Definitely in excess of three and a half years, that's for sure. So it wasn't really so it wasn't really a design shortcoming on their end. It was a uh, human error on my end. Now, the two gracefully separate, leaving you with basically a shell. 
So there's more. And uh, yeah, there is more to this. And uh, I wish you could feel how heavy this was on video. Because this thing weighs like a couple of pounds. So, I am going to unscrew this motherboard from the, uh, I'm basically just going to call it a back plate at this point. Back plate, back plate, motherboard tray, whatchamacallit, doohickey, thingamajig. There's a variety of names for it. I mean, this is all one, I mean, this attaches to a, like, a pound or a pound and a half block of milled aluminum, if not steel. I don't know, I don't know if it's magnetic or not. I wouldn't be surprised. It, uh, expect it to be aluminum. I'd definitely be a little bit surprised if it was steel. But it is a solid chunk of metal, that is for dang sure. And before I separate the motherboard from its back plate, I'm just going to take you on a tour of this thing. Here's our riser card slot. We have a single lonely SATA port, a bunch of open pads for something. Look, there's even uh, BGA balls right there in place. Here's our power switch, uh, serial ports, gigabit Ethernet, and two USB ports times two, DVI, and a bunch of status indicator LEDs. We have two compact flash uh, card slots. This is the one that is accessible from outside. And this one right here, when you seal this system up, this thing is completely inaccessible and nobody is getting to it. Now, we have a parallel port breakout slot here. And we even have two internal USB ports, one of them having a curious looking cover over it. But those look like standard USB ports. And that looks like a standard behavior for a handy cam whenever you're trying to do something important with it. So, go ahead and pop the motherboard off of the steel back plate. And uh, there is literally a processor card on this motherboard. Like, it is a it is basically a processor card because we have let me see yeah this is this, this is our Intel Atom N270 CPU here's our north bridge and here's our south bridge and uh, this thing connects with like uh, t this thing has like two 200 pin connectors on the bottom of it so there's like 400 pins connecting this and right there is a DDR2 RAM slot and this is attached with four more screws we'll set this off to the side for now and just admire this big chunky steel backplate a steel or aluminum backplate ooh that's trippy That is neat. We have milled backplate. Uh, looks like the uh, standoffs are firmly pressed in. So, we'll put that away back there. And then, I'm going to go ahead and raise the camera.
so that way you can see this board a little bit better. So I am going to undo the four screws holding everything together here. find a better way to support this thing. There we go. Okay, so I have the processor card unscrewed from the motherboard. Now it is basically a matter of lifting up and uh, mechanically disengaging the processor card from the rest of the motherboard. Okay, let's see here. I know I had motherboard supported like this somehow last time I was doing this and off it comes and there is a ton of SMD componentry on here and the uh, male end of these couple of 200 pin connectors at least I believe it's at least I believe they are 200 pin, 200 pin connectors. Now the existence of these processor cards implies uh, that there might be an actual processor upgrade, a processor upgrade card available for these computers. And if there are 60, if there, if you have seen other processor cards for these systems, uh, comment down below because I would be interested in a 64-bit process because if, if one if something along the line if a, such a product exists I'd like to know because well if such a product exists I'd be interested in purchasing a 64-bit processor card upgrade now I need to go ahead and seat this back down Basically, just line up the basically line up the screw holes until it drops into place. Then press down. And it's not like I'm reseating 400 pins at the same time. So all so it, now that it's back together. Now that the two are reunited once again, I'm going to go ahead and screw these two pieces back together. I figure at the factory they had some kind of an assembly jig to hold these uh, halves, well to hold this motherboard upside down while the processor card is being reinstalled, but now that we have the processor card reinstalled we can go ahead and reinstall our 2 gigabytes of DDR2 RAM since it is exposed to the world. Uh, but not before 
we reinstall the sill pad. like that. Okay. So, go ahead and put that back in there. And now, we can go and we can set this back into place. And, at this point, and at this point, it's basically just system reassembly. So, from here until the end of system reassembly, there's not really going to be a whole lot of commentary. Interesting how they have a three pin fan connector on the motherboard.
And it looks like the camera battery has just quit. Well, farfing nougan. probably should start looking into a replacement battery for this thing. And there it goes. Okay, everybody, we are back. And as you can see, I have fully reassembled the system. And just moments ago, before the camp, and just moments ago, before the tape started rolling, I realized I forgot to reinstall the CMOS battery. And uh, I do know that we still need to reinstall the hard disk drive. So... And I did a little bit of experimenting, and apparently you, and it looks like you, and I know this because I just did it, you can add and remove expansion cards without ever taking off the side covers to screw right. This, I don't know what's going on with this thing right here. I don't know if there's thread locker jammed in the threads here, or if the threads are just, or if the threads are just totally jacked. So, but anyways, we got seven screws to undo, five on the top and two at the back. 
and there's a Windows XP Professional for Embedded Systems product key there. If you can manage to, you can manage to make that out. Excellent for you. But I'm going to see if I can't reinstall the CMOS battery through the uh, top of the computer. So I'm just going to go ahead and slide that off, and it looks like we can. Let me see here if I can. Okay, so that is the CMOS battery reinstalled through the top of the system. So now we will go ahead and close everything back up. Yep, battery is good. Yeah, that's why I don't like those sockets because it is, it may. I don't like those sockets because with those sockets it's unclear which way the battery uh, should face and I've seen it and I think I've seen it go both ways the, depending on how the system manufacturer wired the motherboard so but I imagine there's a reverse protection uh, I imagine there's a reverse polarity protection diode installed on the motherboard that will happily short that battery. That will happily uh, uh, put that battery right across the resistor and uh, protect whatever and protect whatever happens to be downstream of it. So I'll go ahead and. Screw this all back together, and then we will turn this thing over and uh, give it a hard drive. And of course, I'll actually fully disassemble the rather interesting hard drive hard drive carrier. And so. Now I'll go ahead and disassemble the rather interesting, interestingly complex hard drive carrier. And go ahead and get a hard drive into this thing for the first time. And let me see. Yeah, this system got pulled out. Of, this system got pulled out of service and mothballed on February fourteenth. So, first time the system will be seeing a hard drive in roughly three months. So, it looks like a simple carrier at first, and then you realize it's a little bit more complex than that. So, go ahead and drop carrier. And so, here it is. So, okay, I need to switch back. My other screwdriver bit. And I'll go ahead and I'll take this thing apart. 
And let me see the shock isolation mounts. We have a screw and a washer. Uh, four sets of those, actually. I'll go ahead and keep the screw and washer pairs matched. Okay, where'd the washer go? Probably somewhere in the carrier. Yep. Okay, and this just silently lifts off. And then you have these rubber washer things, which are, which serve to mechanically isolate this from the rest of the system. Now I've got our hard drive right here, and I put the mounting screws for it on the bottom. And looks like I'll need to go to back to my large bit. Yep. And the hard drive is supposed to be installed, I believe, just like this, where the SATA ports are basically all that's exposed here on the front, because it'll be getting mounted, because it'll wind up getting mounted into the carrier like this, and then it'll end up going into the computer, and and it'll end up going to the computer like this and the saddest stuff is going to be on this end so yeah, I'd say this hard drive is going to be pretty well encased and computer this is a 120 gigabyte WD Scorpio drive this is not the original drive to this system. The original drive to this system was, um, take a guess. If you guessed Seagate Mall Menace, you're correct. Uh, yeah, the, this system originally had a Seagate Mall Menace drive, and you can probably guess how that went. <laughs> Yeah, it was completely dead. Uh, in fact, in my intro that I've been running since, let's say, 2019, I believe, one of the intro clips is a computer attempting to boot Windows XP and then blue screening, I believe, on inaccessible boot device. And that is this system blue screening on that Seagate hard drive because, well, that hard drive is totally trashed. Okay. And it does look like this carrier can accommodate two hard drives. And I think depending, yes, this this system does have, this system can be built to uh, carry two hard drives in it. Because there are provisions for a second SATA port, and there are also provisions for a second uh, SATA breakout cable. A second set of power to break out thing and ooh the camera won't worry. And then uh, installation is a reserve is a reverse of removal.
Okay. So hard drive is remounted in the carrier. So go ahead and go ahead and reposition the camera. Down on that end. Okay, so I'm going to connect up our SATA power and our SATA data. It is a true test. This right here is a test of patience. Plug that and move the SATA data forward. Okay. There we go. Basically, this whole thing just drops into place, and then we can screw it all back together. contraption I came up with a few years ago to power this thing. Yep. <laughs> yes, that is exactly what you think that is. That is two power supplies zip-tied to each other. But once you unravel the cabling, it actually starts to make sense. So I basically took two power supplies with the same voltage ratings and put them in parallel so that way the amperage ratings match up for what the computer wants. Then I built my own custom power cable. Just, uh, basically you plug it in here and it goes to both of these supplies at the same time. Then I took their outputs and came up with my own wiring harness here which puts the outputs of these two supplies in parallel and we have red for positive and black for negative because this is DC power so change uh, screwdriver bits yet again and I have a three pin I have a three pin Phoenix connector here because this is what this particular system takes Okay. Okay, it looks like positive is on the extreme left hand side. Of course, that means negative is going to be square in the middle and 
Uh, I've never had a ground connected up on the computer, and it is run perfectly fine without it. In fact, I think the two are actually electrically tied together in the power, power supply module. And the power supply sub-module of the uh, riser card Okay, positive and negative. Okay, cool. So, now, uh, we are going to connect this thing up to some electrical power. Well, actually, we're going to connect this thing up to a bunch of other stuff, too. Okay, here we have a passive DVI-A to VGA adapter. We'll go ahead and connect that up, and we're going to connect our video cable and since Ubuntu server is not a graphical operating system we're only going to go with a single USB port uh, we won't need we won't need that today and now I'm going to go ahead and plug this contraption in and it's either going to work or we're going to get a, or we're about to get some answers to the questions of will my, uh, which breaker trips first and will the UPS survive this? So here we go. Okay, uh, no explosions. So now I'm going to connect up our 3 pin Phoenix power connector. And, uh, there we go. You saw some lights flash here. Now we have a uh, orange standby light indicating to us that standby power is indeed on. Let me go ahead and move our, tri move our tripod over and hopefully not set it down on a shelf. Okay, standby power is indeed on. Now, go ahead and hit the power button. We get a single beep indicating post is started, and oh, auto please. Uh, I don't know where the auto button is, and uh, it appears to be trying. It almost started booting up into Ubuntu server. Okay, now we're in the, now we are in the BIOS. So, we are basically just going to go ahead and train through here. Okay, it is... 5, 27, 20, 2021, it is 17 after midnight, and, okay, one hard drive, nothing else, all but keyboard, and we have a lot of other stuff in here, holy cow. Okay. Set mode IDE. Uh, no. We I'm basically basically in there just set the date and time to something sane. And uh, let's go ahead and look at our Okay, VBAT is 3.28 volts. Alrighty, looks like our system is about to go for boot.
I think I just hit input select. Uh, these view sonic monitors are weird. I can't ever can't ever remember which one does an auto config. Anyways, oh, uh, we're gonna go ahead and go for boot. Ubuntu server 18.04.5. We're just gonna have a look around here at the system configuration and whatnot. Uh, I do fully expect it. I do fully expect it to hang on boot up whenever it gets to uh, bringing up the network interfaces. Yep. Yep. Starting raised network interfaces. Yep, I uh, fully expected it to hang there. Yeah, it looks like it actually got through that. Okay, yep. Okay. Actually managed to bring up our network interfaces and there it is compiling shore shore wall rules and rc.local network is unreachable and here we are logging into the system last login january 9th is before January 9th is the very last time I logged in here, at least according to the disk image, uh, before I started, before I put IP fire on here and all that other stuff happens, so. Yeah, so. You see, EMP3S0 was the uh, WAN interface, and EMP4S0 was the LAN interface. Uh, so, let me see, top time, what top time is it on here, VN stat, nope, HTOP, yeah, HTOP's on here, yeah, this system really didn't do too much. CTL status, APCPS, and DEN. Of course, it's trudging through a ton of binary logs. And yeah, communication to the UPS lost. But uh, this is the first time uh, this system is booted. According to the disk image, this is the first time this system is booted since like January 9th. I really do not have a whole lot of stuff on here in the way of monitoring software. Uh, how, about we, how about we look at the uh, Shorewall config. Actually, CD... And uh, I've quite a few uh, blacklist, uh, blacklist files on here. Okay, go ahead and drop the exposure a bit so you can read that. Since this camera does have a habit of blowing out the picture whenever a good chunk of it is dark, like one, two, th one, two, three, four, five. Uh, BL rules files. And basically, a lot of, a lot of old configuration in here. But, uh, 
person. But a lot, but a reason why I decided to switch to another firewall product is well, ease of maintenance and uh, future proofing because this uh, system was starting to have quite a bit of problems uh, in terms of like the actual firewalling stuff. Like at some point or another, shore wall just basically. Uh, tripped over itself and this system can no longer access the internet like firewall system itself can no longer get access the internet when shore wall was running but everything else could which is bizarre so we'll figure that out and uh yeah it was becoming a pain to maintain to be quite honest and i wanted I wanted more out of it than I was getting with my current firewall solution. So, yeah. yeah. I wanted more out of it than what I was getting with Shorewall as a firewall solution. So, I uh, changed firewall software solutions and, well, this system ended up out of service and indefinitely mothballed. Now, I don't know what's to... I really don't know what the future is for the system. Because uh, I don't have I don't have any further uses for it. However, me and David Phantom have talked in the past about uh, him borrowing uh, this system for doing speed tests on a on such a, on this older Intel Atom processor. So I mean, of course that means sending the whole sending the whole thing uh, hard drive, power supply, and hard drive, power supplies, data acquisition card and all. Uh, so you know, I could remove the data I could remove the data acquisition card and put a proper slot blank in its place. Uh, I'd like to do that. In fact, I pro in fact, if I do send the system off somewhere, I probably will do that. And pulling on the table is not exactly a good idea whenever you're trying to roll a chair onto carpet, because then that happens. Uh, but anyways, there's not really there's not really a whole lot to speak of for this system now. There's not really a whole lot to speak of for this system because I mean it didn't do it did not do much. It basically did two it basically did one thing and that was it. It firewalled. <laughs> and that was basically it. Let's see if I have anything in the home directory. I do uh yeah, looks like I tried to set up an ERPXE server on here. That didn't work. And uh, AAAA, uh, owned by Root Root. Okay, yeah, well, this install came around on January 3rd, 2018. So, yeah. And there's there's some stuff on here from messing around with APC PSD. And there's also an old ARP dot there's also an old shell script that I had to run every time the network bounced. Uh, but there's also an old shell script on here that I ran every uh, this this dates APC no uh, ARP dot SH this dates back to uh, the tech room network the Tech Room Network Bridge era. Uh, and I had to run that every time the network connection bounced uh, between this system and the Tech Room Network Bridge. Because uh, the old, this system here, it was either this system or the Tech Room Network Bridge. One of the two just eight ARP requests. Like it would like it would get an ARP like it would get an ARP request and it just it would end up in a black it would end up in a black hole somewhere. The functioning 
it would end up in the functional equivalent of death knoll. And I mean, it just bounced completely. Did like the system didn't even reply to it, so I had to manually set up a, I had to manually set up a route. Yeah, I had to manually set this ARP put this ARP entry into the into the routing table. Uh, so, so that way the network would actually come up and work. And I think uh, I actually put this in my uh, R in my uh, RC dot local. Uh, yep, I actually put I actually put this in my RC dot local file. And as you can see, I have a couple of if config statements in here that brought up the LAN interface and set up its IP address, brought up short, brought up shore wall and set and put the ARP, put this entry into, put that ARP entry into the routing table. And then continued on with system boot up. So, yeah, there's not a whole lot to speak of. There's not a whole lot to speak of here. It's about half past. It is about half past midnight, and so I think the next time, I believe the next portion of video you will see here is um, re is basically me re mothballing this system for the indefinite future. And uh, pulling out the Dakar 2005, and go and going ahead and uh, putting a slot blank in its place and everything like that. So, anyways, we're gonna go ahead and shut this system down. And there it goes. Looks like I will see y'all in the next park.